Hello, my name is Sean Lacey. I'm the Research Integrity and Compliance Officer for the University. And this video is a short presentation on data collection and data format, which is a component of the training module research ethics at MTU, the application process. I'm first going to start by presenting a definition that we have for research data in the university. And this comes from the research data management policy on page four. And you'll see from the definition here that research data um, to what it relates to and to how it's obtained is quite wide and varied. The examples here are, as always, they're not exhaustive, but it definitely gives a good flavor to what research data relates to. And if the research data that we have from our research studies comes from human participants, well, then research ethical approval is required. In our application forms, there's a couple of areas to the forms where data collection and data format are called out. In the minimal risk research ethics application form question six and the full ethical review uh, research ethics application form question five, there is a section there, uh, or sorry, there's a table on where you're asked to specify what method of data collection are you using? So is your data being collected from standard educational practices? So are, are you carrying out research on your lecturing methods? Is the data being collected from uh, interviews or focus groups? public observations? Has the data already been collected and you're analyzing data that already exists as in secondary data and you'd, all, you'd have consent to do that? Is the data coming from surveys, questionnaires, audio or video recordings? And obviously, as always with these lists and something I've always kind of said in all the videos is they, they're not exhaustive. There can all be, all, always be other, um, in this case, other methods of data collection. And if there are in your, for your research study, that's where you'd uh, state that in the final option. And when you tick uh, whichever uh, whichever option you're going with here, then it's you give brief details on that type of data collection method. Then later on in the application form, so in question 10 for the minimal risk and question 14 for the full ethical review, human research ethics application form respectively, there is a section on where you say what recording device are you gonna be using to collecting your data. So will you be collecting the data using audio or sound, photography, videography related uh, devices, computer, laptop, tablet, iPad, or other? And it's a case of then whichever one you select here, and it, you do, it should be one type because you will be collecting the data using a particular method, then you'd state on, at the bottom part of the, the, uh, the table to how you're, I suppose, obtaining permission from your participants to do that. So this is where you're outlining to your participants what method you're using to actually, I suppose, record the information. Later on then in the application form in relation to data format, there is for question 11 for the minimal risk uh, component and question 15 for the full ethical review, human research ethics application forms respectively, there is a section on the data format to will the data be anonymous, de-identified, identifiable, potentially identifiable or pseudo-anonymized. Uh, and I'll give, I, I outline what I mean by them now in the next couple of slides, but it's the case here is where I suppose in the application form, you're stating how you're going to collect the data. So it might be identifiable at the start, but then you'll make it anonymous. So how you collect it and then how you'll be storing it or accessing it later on. And this is where you'd be stating this in the application form. And as the next section really, and how this video is going to be just finished off, is just giving, I suppose, an outline to what each of these mean and just giving a, a basic example for each one as well. So anonymous, I, I think it, would, it kind of speaks for itself, really. It's where the data has been collected that um, where it doesn't contain any personal participant information. So the classic example in this case, would be anonymous surveys. So for carrying out anonymous survey, this is where you're you're not getting any identifiable information on your participants. So that obviously means the control afterwards with regard um, the processing of the data is will be a lot more manageable. The next type, and this is in no particular order, but are actually alphabetical order. The next type is where your data will be de-identified. So this is where you gather your data you remove any identifiers from it and you remove it in a way that you cannot trace back or track back 
to the identity identity of any of your participants. So this is where your data is essentially de-identified but in an irreversible manner. And an example of this would be where you might carry out an interview, um, whether you're recording the interview or not, but you carry out an interview where you know the participant, you remove any identifiers from the participant, uh, and then you store that transcript thing going forward where there's no identifiable information. And again, the fact that they can't be uh, traced back to the participant, that is what it makes it de-identified. Identifiable then is where you're gathering data on a participant and that participant can be identified, whether it be directly or indirectly. A classic example of this is where you might be doing a video recording. When you do a video recording, obviously you know who the participant is. So that's where the data is going to be identifiable at the start. Now, are you leaving it in that form? Is that going to be your main data source, a video? Or are you going to be maybe potentially transcribing the video and then once it's transcribed and the participants, a participant approves of the transcription that you might be de deleting the video recording and that's obviously something that you need to be out, uh, sharing in the application form but i suppose if you're storing video recordings kind of going forward throughout your research study that's obviously where your data is going to be some way identifiable in that case potentially identifiable then is where you have i suppose gathered data at the start where the participants are identified but then you remove any potential identifiers that you may have and replace those identifiers with a code and then you store that code or often will be called the key separate to that raw data that you'd have so you remove the participants ids identifiers sorry not necessarily id but identifiers but you keep a track record of a code that you're using for the identifiers and that track record or for the and the code which again will be called the key would be stored somewhere separate okay now how this could be potentially identifiable and this doesn't it's not for all research studies here but i suppose it depends on your research study if you carry out a focus group as an example so in a focus group you have a group of participants now you will obviously i assume in some way maybe be transcribing the information that you have from that focus group when you transcribe it you will remove any identifiers and that's all very good practice but when you report back the results, when you publish the results and you might use a couple of quotes in it, if the participants from the focus groups are reading your report or your publication, they might, even though the quote might not come from them, they might recognize who the quote does come from, from actually being in the focus group and actually hearing the quote being actually staced or the statement being made. So that's a case of where the data, although you're doing your best, I suppose, to, I suppose, in a way, uh, remove any identifiers it is still potentially identifiable and that's just something to be aware of though that's often just the case and it's the nature of carrying out a focus group but it's to call that out and to state that that will be the case in your uh, informed consent uh, leaflet okay and so that information leaflet in your informed consent uh, document is to be calling that out okay so that you're being upfront that the, the data that you obtained even though you will remove any identifiers there is a small risk of the data being potentially identifiable or the participants being potentially identifiable okay the last type then is where you'd pseudo anonymize so this is very similar to the potentially identifiable except there is no track back to that potentially identifiable so it's where you have the participants id at the start you replace any identifiers with a, a pseudonym or a value so that's where you're pseudo anonymizing the data and so that now means that the participant cannot be directly identified. Okay, and the example for this then would be your participant records uh, where you're removing all identifiers. Okay, now there's obviously a certain link between pseudo anonymized and potentially identifiable. And really what will split them is, I suppose, the type of um, research method, the data collection method that you're using. And that data collection method goes back to the one of the previous questions that you'd answer in the application form. So as always with this then, there can be questions because again this is the presentation here and this video is not exhaustive okay so there might be a case of that you might have other kind of um, thoughts to data format you might have thoughts to other data collection methods and looking for a bit of guidance on it if you are then please as always use the discussions function on that uh, on canvas appropriate title to the discussion and then that's where it this discussions i suppose uh, can evolve to an faq section as well the references that are mainly used for this uh, would be the coming from the Data Protection Commissioner. Two documents there. I won't read out the title, 
but those uh, documents have, uh, are uploaded to the Canvas module. And obviously, additional to these references, then are our own kind of codes, policies, and procedures within the university as well. That's it for now. All the best.